Hello. Today I'm looking at flowering plants on our homestead. I'm Liz Zorab and this is By the Farm. I'll leave links for these plants uh, in the video description and information box. Here in the front garden uh, there are some roses. This one uh, is called My Valentine and it was given to me by my daughter one Valentine's Day uh, because Mr J and I don't celebrate Valentine's but my daughter felt I should have a rose <laughs> for Valentine's Day. So this is it. It has beautiful uh, red flowers but the thing that I find most attractive is that the young foliage is this beautiful bronze colour and that's reflected really nicely um, in the herbs down here. Now, these are weeds. Uh, anywhere else in the garden I would consider this a weed but I'm quite happy for this bank of it to be here because the colour of the stems um, and the, the tinge on the edges of the leaves just echoes this colour so nicely. It actually just looks really pretty and um, when we sit at the kitchen table and we look out in this direction uh, this is what I can see. And just behind me here uh, is a pink rose. This came from my friend Jane. And it's actually not very much to look at. It seems to get quite a lot of black spot, but it earns its place in the garden because the smell, the fragrance of this rose is just beautiful. The shrubbery here uh, is one of the first areas that I planted when we moved in uh, four and a half years ago. And I put in quite, well they weren't small plants but in comparison to how they are now they were small. And I put in things that would have some flowering interest right through the year. And I also put in things that mean something to me. So at the back there is a bay tree uh, which I was given uh, by colleagues when I left work. And there's a couple of hebes that were here when we moved in. Uh, this enormous lavender plant uh, was given to me by Jane, uh, as was uh, this beautiful hardy fuchsia that's now coming into flower uh, and will flower now right through uh, till early winter. The flowering cherry up here was given to me by my daughter uh, as a tiny rooted tree about 8 inches, maybe 10 inches tall. Uh, I grew it on in a pot for a year, then got it into the ground and it's, it's been wonderful and it has flowered for the first time this year. Uh, here is uh, St John's Warp, uh, so this is Hypericum uh, and I think this is Headcut and it has seeded itself all over the place uh, so I find young plants here, there and everywhere and just repot them. Uh, there are some, and I can never remember their proper name, but everyone calls them elephant's ears. I think it's a begonia, uh, and I'm not a huge fan of them. Again, I was given it by Jane, and I just thought it would be quite nice as ground cover. At the back there, uh, there is a yellow broom, and there's an, another yellow plant uh, whose name I can't remember. I'll pop it up on the screen. It flowers all winter long with these bright yellow flowers and a honey fragrance. And if I didn't have that, I'd look for a Mahonia to go there, but that just works perfectly. <laughs> this red rose uh, also came from Jane, except it came from me because I gave it to Jane. Uh, she had it for about 15 or 20 years and then she bought it back and she bought it back to me about the size of a large football. Uh, so in four years it's, <laughs> it has exploded like this. Um, I'm going to try and take some more cuttings from it this year. Uh, I absolutely love it and I think a hedge uh, of these little red roses that just keep going through the whole summer would be lovely. Uh, I don't deadhead it as often as I might. Uh, in fact, I can even see hips on it uh, from last year still, uh, which I didn't then uh, use in the kitchen. But it does these <laughs> beautiful displays of uh, little red flowers. So they're not huge. They're not, they're very, very lightly fragranced. I was gonna say they're not fragranced at all. They're very lightly fragranced 
but just en masse. I find these just so attractive and I like the way they then contrast uh, with the cream and silver foliage here. Uh, tucked in at the back there, there's an azalea. Not a huge fan, but it was here when we moved in, so I just transplanted it from where it was to there. Uh, and here is my very favourite, uh, what I call peaches and cream rose. I have taken some cuttings of it. It's a little patio rose. They're just about to come into flower and equally I'd have lots of those in the garden. Uh, and then dotted uh, towards that direction some more hebe and, uh, and some lavender. And at the back is a spirea, uh, which isn't in flower now. That's an early spring one. I think some people call it a bridal bouquet uh, spirea. Anyway, it's very pretty. I'm really pleased with the whole of this border. This is the fence that separates uh, the shrubbery uh, from uh, the main part of our gardens. And I planted this uh, Clematis jackmanii uh, pretty much when we first moved in. It's beautiful, vivid purple flowers, absolutely delightful. Um, and there's also one on this side of the fence, uh, scrambling up this way to meet it. And the first couple of years, uh, I had a tripod uh, of willow sticks that it scrambled up. I've taken that down and um, I'm hoping uh, that these, this cane will be enough for it this year uh, and likewise on the other side. And in a few years time, uh, there's a rose over there that I've planted and hopefully the rose will grow along here and this will be able to scramble through it. So this is the most recent uh, little flower bed that I've put in. And uh, eventually I will take the frame away, but it was uh, something that allowed me to put the compost in and kind of concentrate on what I was doing. Uh, here's the rose uh, that came to me from Jane starts off with yellow flowers and as they open they fade to this creamy ivory white uh, and it's actually a very vigorous plant so it will cover the whole of this fence uh, in just a few years. Uh, it's very floriferous so there are going to be masses and masses of flowers. I'm excited about this. I know at the moment it still looks really small but I've seen it at Jane's house um, and I know what a huge area it covers at her place. I'm really hoping it will do just as well here. Uh, and then I've put in, uh, there's two currant bushes here. Um, there are, uh, there's a red lobelia here, which will do uh, tall red flowers in the late summer, early autumn. Uh, chives, which earn their place in the vegetable garden and in the flower garden. I love these flowers, as do the bees. Uh, there's some penstemon and I've popped in some Californian poppies, uh, which are annuals. So they'll just do their thing and they'll be allowed to sow their seeds. Uh, and then hopefully we'll have a few more of those. And in the front here um, is a rosemary grown from a cutting. Uh, when I made a, a video about taking cuttings, uh, so that's grown from that then. Um, and uh, that will also do those lovely little mauvey purple flowers, which hopefully uh, will reflect the same colour uh, as these chives as time goes on. In the foreground there, uh, there's some catmint, which I think is called nepeta. And at the back here uh, is uh, some sweet rocket. I love sweet rocket. This, <laughs> it's like a sea of frothy white <laughs> flowers. And they're just white flowers uh, at this time of day. But as dusk comes, they seem to almost come alive. And that's the time uh, when you can really smell their fragrance. And they just fill the air with a cloud of, of really strong, sweet uh, flower fragrance. Uh, below it are some peonies. This is uh, Sarah Bernhardt. It's just in bud now. They're just starting to open so I can see the pink of the outer petals. And this little border I created <laughs> uh, out of desperation, really. Um, I had done a border across by the fence that all went to weeds because I didn't attend to it. So I kind of rescued what I could from there and put them in here a couple of years ago. And bit by bit, I'm decanting uh, these plants to other places in the garden. 
here in the duck enclosure there are some very old fruit trees. This elderberry has been here for many years and it was originally uh, grown inside a big uh, commercial greenhouse that was taken down long before we moved here. Uh, but when the greenhouse was taken down the tree uh, fell over. Its trunk runs horizontally along the ground uh, and all the branches now go upwards uh, off that trunk and it has uh, seeded itself and sent out some runners so uh, some of the sections at this end um, are actually coming out of the ground uh, where seeds have dropped uh, and they've grown but it's all just in one big piece and uh, the smell here at the moment is just amazing. I haven't been entirely convinced of the smell of elderflowers in the past but on mass like this and on the tree it's just lovely. And to try and give you uh, some idea of size, uh, I'm somewhere between five foot six and five foot seven, that's 170 centimetres. Um, it's probably twice my height um, and it's huge. <laughs> And looking in the opposite direction from the elderberry uh, are these damson and plum trees. I think some of these are wild plum and each spring these are absolutely smothered in flowers. Uh, the blossoms are beautiful, they smell great and uh, a good set of blossoms and some good weather conditions afterwards mean that we will get plenty of uh, plums and damsons this year. And I'm just looking um, I can't see lots of them but they kind of appear without me noticing uh, and this one uh, produces a very small yellow very sweet little plum. When I first started gardening uh, in the 1970s it wasn't the vegetable garden that had got my attention but flowers, um, not necessarily roses. I thought they were a bit, I actually thought they were a bit old-fashioned. I've changed my mind about that, uh, definitely. Um, I was watching uh, Gardener's World being presented by Jeff Hamilton and he was showing, uh, he was using small asters and showing how you could take cuttings and that weekend uh, when I was at the local fruit and veg shop they had some asters. I bought one planted, these little tiny really purple uh, daisy like flowers, took some cuttings and within a few weeks they'd grown roots and that was it. I'm totally hooked on gardening. Uh, <laughs> I was going to be a gardener for the rest of my life because I was just so amazed uh, at how clever nature is to be able to you know, make new plants. And so uh, when I first started gardening uh, in my own garden, it was a flower garden that I created and um, it probably took me about five years to uh, start growing vegetables, but I started off with flowers and so it was odd when we came here and I spent so much time creating a vegetable garden and it took me three years actually to start building a proper flower garden. And I kept telling Mr J that I felt like there was something missing here and I couldn't work out what it was. And then about 18 months ago I started creating uh, this area that I call the patron's garden and uh, that's what was missing. It was an area that is mostly flowers and some foliage uh, that is in some ways just total frivolity. Uh, there is one bed further down there where it's just uh, all my favourite flowers. This bed uh, is the cottage garden um, and it's not that it has particularly cottage garden plants in it, it's that a lot of these plants uh, were at my parents cottage. Um, many of them I'd given to my parents and then after we sold their house the owner of their house came and spent a day with me here bought me lots of those plants small pieces of those plants so they are growing in this area so every time i walk past here i just have a little bit of a think about mum and dad this big old beast of a plant up here um, is angelica and i just i love the structure of it it's big and blousy and architectural and says look at me uh, the flowers were really really delicate, tiny tiny little white flowers, there's just a few of them left now and then you get these beautiful seed heads, I really like it, it's a biennial so this has done its thing now, uh, it will die back down 
I've got some seeds uh, to start again. So in two years time, we'll have this again. I like the way this sits in the setting and if I wanted to, uh, I could candy the stems uh, and use them as cake decorations. This little corner just here, I'm really pleased with. It's just <laughs> this time of year, it's all purples, which is wonderful. So there's the purple from the chives and this deep pinky purple uh, from the aqualegia. And then uh, this cotinus, the smoke bush, is just bringing out its very dark, dark leaves now. And that's a really uh, bronzy purple, if that makes sense. Uh, beautiful leaves. And then it has pink uh, fluffy flowers at a later moment. But it's the colour of the foliage against the aqualegia and the chives. I just love. And behind it here uh, is some salsify which also has lovely purple flowers when they open. And just for a few moments, for just a matter of days, when the chives and the salsify and the aquilegia and the cotinus are all out, it just makes a beautiful little picture here. This is what I call the long border. And I quite carefully designed this. So I didn't design the size of it. The size of it was just pretty much the lengths of the wood that I had. Um, <laughs> and I put them together. Um, so it's 17 and a half feet long and four feet wide. Uh, and I filled it uh, with uh, compost from uh, your municipal tip uh, so that you can buy from the local authority. Um, and then I set about quite carefully planning what plants would go where and then sourcing them. Now, reality is there are plants that I didn't ever get hold of and there are plants that I acquired that weren't in the plan. So uh, this uh, Dicentra uh, spectabilis here, not in the plan, absolutely love it. Uh, spotted it in our local garden centre last year and it was just like, I want one of those. Uh, so I'm very pleased with that. And there's a load of uh, Achillea, which uh, wasn't in the plan, but my friend Erica over at Erica's Little Welsh Garden, they gave me some tiny mini plug plants for my birthday, I've grown them on. They're amazing. They were so beautiful last year and now they've just spread uh, an awful lot. So I've been able to uh, take parts of them away, and move them to other places. Uh, they've been, they've been an absolute joy. The idea with this border was that it would have uh, very pale colours and very muted colours at this time of year. So I started it uh, with a whole load of creamy white daffodils. Well, not many of those came up, but I'm hoping in future years they might. Um, and then so these nice muted, uh, pale muted pinks and mauves. Uh, and creams going through it and, and at that end there's a lot of purpley mauves but they're still these very pale colours and then as the year goes on the colours that come up through become stronger uh, so just here is a delphinium which will send up uh, tall hopefully even taller than that but tall flower spikes and they're a much darker purple uh, and the penstemon here is a very rich pinky purple uh, and the penstemon here is a very deep pink. Uh, there's a darker pink peony which hasn't come out yet but um, hopefully that might put an appearance and so as the season goes on more pinks, more reds. Um, there's a monada uh, which does, uh, it's got quite a dark red and then as we head into the end of August, uh, it starts <laughs> changing colour very much and there's a lot more uh, darker colours and then there's yellows come in. So yellows and oranges come in uh, with things like Coreopsis um, and um, what they called Echinaceas. Uh, so I, I've actually put in plants that will change the whole colour uh, towards the end of the season and it will become much richer, much hotter colours uh, as the year goes on. Apart from one plant, uh, which is a lavender uh, down by my feet, everything here uh, is a herbaceous perennial. So it pretty much disappears down uh, <laughs> during the winter. Um, 
The borage uh, that I popped in uh, just as a filler last year, well that stayed throughout the winter but that's seen better days now, that's ready for me to take out and that will leave space for other things to come through. And um, what else have we got? Oh yes, this. This is a teasel, um, not something you would necessarily normally find in a flower bed. Uh, I was given it by Jane two years ago, possibly three, and I nurtured them. Uh, I nurtured some of them as tiny weeny little plants and I should have got them in the ground sooner uh, and I didn't and most of them died except for this one. Um, and it has, I just popped it in here thinking I'll put it in there for now. Um, it's beautiful, it is about to flower which means I can collect some of the seeds uh, and <laughs> sow those and actually plant it in a much more appropriate place uh, in the hedgerows. There are some plants I think are worth investing in um, and alliums are one of them. Look at this beauty. Uh, masses of little stars in a, not quite a globe, uh, a sort of three quarters globe, doesn't quite go around to the bottom, but it's absolutely lovely. Uh, and I've put it with uh, this very dark, uh, it's like a cow parsley. And this is another one of them. Uh, it was a plant that was recommended by Monty Don uh, last year on a program. And uh, I found uh, three, tiny little plug plants being sold on uh, that very well-known auction site. Uh, so I have two in this border and one in the cottage border. I'm really pleased to see um, I've now got seeds on this so I will be able to grow more of it. I love that it's, it's so dark in colour on the stems and yet it's very light and airy and I like that kind of juxtaposition of the, the depth of colour and yet the light frothiness. In this section uh, I've done a bit of rearranging in the last few days so there are uh, plenty of forget-me-nots in here. I'm quite happy for those to self-seed uh, and just <laughs> fill this space. Uh, it's, it's great as a ground cover, I really like the colour of them and you know, at this time of year there aren't as many uh, flowers around so I like that. Uh, and just here, uh, this could be uh, garlic chives uh, or it could be Star of Bethlehem and I'm not sure which it is. And when I was doing uh, my homestead tour for May, uh, I had them in the veg garden and said, and these are garlic chives and a couple of people said to me, they might not be garlic chives, they might be Star of Bethlehem, uh, which is poisonous. And so I decided that I would take them out of the vegetable garden bring them over here, uh, get them into this bed which is very much a do not eat um, and, and just not run the risk uh, because I'm fairly sure that they are garlic chives but who wants to gamble uh, <laughs> with a plant that is poisonous. So they're over here, I love the way this white is against the dark foliage, I like the way it's going to come up uh, through the forget-me-nots in the future. So I'm quite happy with that there. I bought these lovely irises uh, as a small clump. Uh, they were a really small clump a couple of years ago uh, via our local uh, Facebook page uh, for the local gardening community. Unknown variety, but we knew that they were purple. They're absolutely lovely. I like these little mauve flowers uh, with then the, uh, the yellow on the tongue there. Really nice. This is the first border uh, that I made uh, in this corner and nearly everything in here is edible. And you can see uh, that some plants are uh, going to seed now. That's okay, they're still attractive. And there are a few surprises in here uh, like daylilies and Solomon seal. Uh, Solomon seal can be eaten uh, like an asparagus, so just the young shoots can be eaten. Daylilies uh, can be eaten. I don't think I want to try them, um, but there are parts of them that can be eaten. Having said that, uh, it really is worth doing your research before you try eating any of these plants, uh, just to make sure you're eating the right part of them. And then behind me uh, is the next section of the raised bed that I made. And well, this has got uh, my very, very beautiful 
uh, Gertrude Ducal Rose in it. I don't have enough uh, hyperbole and, and the right words to tell you how much I like this rose. I love how full the flowers are and even as they're going over they're hugely blousy. Uh, they almost look like a peony and the smell, the fragrance is just so strong and as you walk uh, through the archway you just get surrounded by this cloud of rose fragrance. I really like them. I, I know I'm saying I really like they're beautiful over and over again but I only have plants in the garden that I really like so um, I do find them beautiful. This one uh, is also useful because it will produce rose hips and with that uh, I make rose hip jelly and rose hip wine. This is a corner that I bring a chair to and sit to contemplate life when I don't want to be found. I can't be seen from the house when I'm here. I've got the polytunnel in front of me so I can't be seen that way. It's just peaceful, quiet and very private. Now this is the far end of the long border uh, with another a cat mint napisa in it. I like the smell uh, but not as much as Monty likes the smell. <laughs> so Monty will actually just come and sit in the middle of this uh, and go to sleep in it. But at the moment again, so I, this has got those uh, lovely purples and again uh, with the uh, salsify here, really nicely and muted against the creamy yellow uh, of the elderberry here. These elderflowers are lovely. Uh, as I said before, uh, they do smell really nice. So this is uh, it's a smaller uh, elderberry tree. I was gonna take this out um, because I felt it was just too many trees given that we've got a big willow uh, tree there and a rowan and, and I keep saying, well, I'll just let it, <laughs> I'll let it get its fruit and then uh, we'll take it out. Uh, I think we might have to maybe next year. This is the wide border. This was the last uh, of the beds that I created in the patron's garden. Couldn't put this one in until we had put the polytunnel up. And once we did, I then uh, created this. And last year, uh, I grew potatoes down the whole length of it. It's 24 feet long and about three and a half feet wide. Um, and I call it the wide border because uh, the long border goes that way. So it's just a way of making a distinction between this one and that one. Uh, so again, I've planted this with uh, plants that I've been given uh, or that I have uh, swapped with people or I've got very cheaply uh, interspersed with plants that I've invested in. Uh, I am always really happy to invest in uh, a, a plant that's really special. So uh, here we've got one of the uh, peonies that I bought a couple of years ago as one of the uh, very tall perennial lobelia uh, which is called Starship Scarlet. I'm saying that looking over there because I can see the label for it over there. I've got some daisies in here, uh, the same kind that you find in your lawn, but I wanted them here to be very small uh, and to reflect um, the Shasta daisies that we've got over here which are big, <laughs> blousy and loud and I just like the way it kind of echoes it. Uh, here is some red orange which um, has self-seeded. I'm very happy uh, for it to self-seed there because this lovely purple will reflect uh, the foliage of the lobelia. Uh, and also uh, in here I've put some brassicas and these are the ones that I'm using as sacrifice brassicas. Across most of the garden I grow my brassicas under netting uh, which protects them from um, cabbage white butterfly and cabbage moth. Uh, so they are sealed <laughs> in there for the season. Now a few, uh, like these Asturian tree cabbage here, I'm growing in the open and that's fine. They tend not to uh, get too attacked by those cabbage whites. Um, but I still want to support that butterfly population and the moth population. I don't want to get rid of them. I just don't want them eating my vegetables. 
So I give them um, some brassicas out in the open that they can lay their eggs on uh, and the caterpillars can happily munch away uh, to continue the butterfly population. And that matters to me because there are so many things that eat butterflies, it's then supporting that population. Uh, so, so everything from uh, frogs, if they can get hold of them, uh, to various different birds and bats. And if we take away the food for the larger animals, then uh, we'll see fewer of those. And I want to encourage as much wildlife as I can into this garden. So back to the wide border here. Uh, <laughs> I've got uh, some dahlias which I've overwintered uh, under straw. Not feeling very hopeful for that one. That was a cafe au lait, that pale uh, coffee coloured, <laughs> pale creamy coloured one. That doesn't look like it's doing anything, but some of the ones that I overwintered in pots in the potty tunnel have survived, so I can replace that if it doesn't grow back. Uh, here's another uh, of the brassicas that I've put in uh, as a sacrifice plant. Uh, I've got a peony here. Oh, it's pretty. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, I can't remember without going back and looking at my plan. Uh, which peony it is, but uh, it's coming, which is good. I like the dill uh, behind it, this bronzy colour, um, it's a frothiness. And I have noticed there's an awful lot of ladybirds this year, which is great because that means there will be fewer aphids. There are a couple of hucherers here. Uh, I like these, these leaves are almost black and then mottled uh, with pink. They kind of look almost marbled flowers are just coming. Again, I bought these uh, in our local Facebook gardening group uh, for just a few pence. Um, it's a really nice way to fill a border to buy very small plants and just let them grow on. These are leeks, um, so I'm allowing those to grow uh, and they'll produce really nice uh, a globe of whitey, creamy white flowers. Uh, here's the lupin I was talking about and some more of the brassicas. Uh, there's a, a salvia, which is like a small shrub there. Uh, I won't let that get too big. Uh, more leeks. And further down there uh, is a globe artichoke with its very silvery foliage, which I want to reflect the colour uh, of the catmint and the pitta there. And as much as possible, I'm reflecting colours uh, and doing some contrasting, but mostly I'm echoing and reflecting because uh, I just find that as actually much more calming and soothing to look at. Well, this tour <laughs> took a bit longer than I'd anticipated. So I hope you've enjoyed having an in-depth look at the flowering plants on our homestead. And don't forget, I will leave links to as many of these plants as I can find the information for uh, in the video description. And so, wherever you are in the world and whatever you've got planned for today, I hope it's a good one. And I also hope you'll join me again next time.